and then we start the new year. Wow, isn't it amazing? In, in about seven weeks, eight weeks, it's going to be 2025. I've all, I've, I feel like I've already, the Lord has already given me or impressed upon me a theme for the new year. Um, we got some special things planned. I'm um, working with Nicholas back here. I'm going to be asking some of you all to tell your story in like five minutes or less. See, the theme for 2025 is going to simply be this. God did it. God did it. How many knows that God can do it? And how many have stories in your life that God did it? Okay. So we're going to get you to, to share that. And at least once a month, we want to, during service, put up one of those videos. Maybe we'll put you on Facebook and you'll come become Facebook famous. Now, if you, do, if you shouldn't be on Facebook for some reason, you need to let us know that when we do it. Because if somebody's looking for you and you don't want to go on Facebook, we make sure. And if you just don't want to be there, we won't put you there. But we just want to share some of your stories about what, what God did. And there's times in your life you know that God has done it. It was him, and it's only him that could do it. And we want to share those stories. So today, as we look at the start of this chapter 4, we're going to look at the joy of harmony. How many knows it's great to be in harmony with one another? How many knows it seems impossible at times to be in harmony with one another? And it seems like in our country right now, it, it's hard to be in harmony, to be in unity, to be in agreement. But I believe that in Christ we should be. So we're going to look at that here in Philippians chapter 4. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this time together. Thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. Lord, we ask that you'll let it speak to our hearts. Lord, let it change our lives. Lord, we thank you that your word is forever true. And Lord, that we can stand on that. And we can trust in that above everything else. Lord, I pray today for our country. Lord, as we've just come through an election. And Lord, there's... there's there's turmoil, and all, there's, there's disagreements, there's hurt, there's joy, there's all types of emotions. Lord, we pray for our country, we pray for our leaders, the ones that are in place, the ones that are coming in, that, Lord, that you will just let give them wisdom, and that, Lord, they will take that wisdom and use it to govern. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we pray for your people, that, Lord, you will protect them and guard them, that, Lord, you will continue, Lord, to lead them. Lord, we pray, Lord, for churches, for Christians around the world. The Lord, that we will all be in unity, be in harmony. And Lord, it will be about you and not the stuff of religion, but it's going to be about Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to, as we look at this last chapter, we're going to discover Paul's prescription for happiness in the first five verses. Now, uh, he begins there, if you go ahead and go to the um, first verse, if you would, please. The first verse. It starts out with the word, therefore. The word, therefore. What does me, therefore mean? It means, because of all of this in the past, therefore this. Because of what I've told you, now... This is where we go from here. That's kind of what he said. So it's, it connects. It's a connecting word. This thought to this thought, therefore. So today as we look at the joy of harmony, we're going to, going to look at some four principles that Paul gives in these, in these verses. And it's not about happiness. See, some, happiness a lot of times is based upon happenstance. Things that just occur all of a sudden make us feel good. But that's fleeting because what happens? You have to go to bed, and the next day it gets up, and it may not happen again. Your happiness may not be the same. But our joy, if it's found in the Lord, because the, the Lord gives us joy, it can be sustained forever. Despite what's going on in our lives, even through the hard times, we can still have joy. Because what did he just tell us at the end of chapter 3? That you know what? That he's going to change these lowly bodies. Our citizenship is not here. We don't have to worry about it. And, all of the stuff that's going on. See, I want you to make sure you get it. The stuff of this life is fleeting and will be gone. When you die or the rapture happens, 
and you go, all of your stuff, your special collections, right now, down in my basement, I've got some toy soldiers. About this big, plastic. My wife tried to get me to get rid of all of them. I've got some tanks and some other stuff. I just couldn't let them go. Some of them are cowboys and Indians. Some of them, I got a few Civil War soldiers. But you know what's going to happen if I die or if I go in the rapture? It stands. This stuff is fleeting and it's going to be gone. It says, don't get caught up in this life. Don't get caught up there. So therefore, the first principle that I want to share with you today from this passage is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. How many ever had fear in your life? Now, please don't put your hand up. But how many are afraid today of something? And I'm not talking about if you go home and find a snake laying in your bed. Okay, that, that's not. I'm just talking about you've got fear. You know, after the election, people had fear. Schools, Ivy League schools, some of the brightest students in America, they were given cookies and milk and sandwiches and Legos and so they could be in their safe spaces and feel good. Fear. Fear. There was lots of fear going into the election. He says, don't be afraid. Look at Philippians 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved, and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Paul is calling them his brethren. He considered the Philippians like family. We're like family. Deborah says it every Every Sunday morning during the announcements, multiple times, we're a family. He says, brethren. He says, brethren. He says, my long for brethren. He has an emotional desire to be close to them. He wants to be with them. And he calls them his joy. And he says, my crown. You're my joy and my crown. First Thessalonians says this in chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or our joy or our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? The, these believers were not Paul's joy on simply human terms, but in their standing in the Lord. To see believers making progress and standing firm in Christ was a source of joy for Paul. He says, you're my joy and my crown. Remember Paul earlier talked about I don't want to have ministered to you and done all of this for nothing to see you fall away. He says, you're my joy, you're my rejoicing, you're my crown, you're my brethren, you're beloved. Twice he says, beloved, beloved. And then he tells them there in that last part to do what? He says, he says, and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. He doesn't tell them to stand fast in their abilities, to stand fast in their intelligence or their education. He doesn't tell them to stand fast in your strength. He says simply stand fast in who? The Lord. Stand fast. He wants them to hold fast to the position in Christ and not let false teachers or, or persecution or circumstances move them. Not let the stuff of this life Move them. He says, stand fast. As they're pressing towards the mark, they're to stand firm against anything that would distract them and take them, pull them away. Now, if you look through the scripture, there was I read something, there was a point that was made. Very rarely in scripture are we told to attack. We're told to stand fast. See, in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says this. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to do with what? Do what? Withstand in the evil day. And having done all, do what? Stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. See, Christ destroyed our enemies at the cross. Yes, we have an enemy that will want to distract us and change our mind, but Christ has destroyed him, and we stand fast in the victory that Christ has won. 
We can go win victory. We stand in that victory. We live in that victory. We pray out of the victory that Christ has given us, and we stand in it. Having done all, he says, do what? Stand. He said, stand fast in the Lord. Church, there's going to be things, and the Bible even talks about it, that in latter days there will be some that would even fall away. He says, stand fast in the Lord. Don't let other things pull you aside. Don't let other things take your vision. Don't let other things take your thought. Trust in the Lord. Keep staying in Him. Because as we stand, we stand in the victory He's already won. We don't have to win all of these victories. He's already won the victory. we got to stand in it. See, Jesus is our answer. He's our hope. He's our victory. He's our source. He's our everything. That's why Paul says, stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in Him. Don't trust in yourself. So they, the Judaizers had come in and said, well, now that you've done this, you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the feast. You need to do all of these things. He said, stand fast in the Lord. Not in your tradition. Not in what you can do. Stand fast in the Lord, brethren. Stand fast, beloved. Stand fast in Him. He's our only source of freedom, grace, and hope. He's our everything. And then he goes on and tells them, which is the second principle, don't be divided. In the church, if we're not careful, we become divided. You know what's divided churches at times? Pews or chairs. Really? Does it matter? That's just tradition. Sometimes it's the color of carpet. I remember we used to have like orange carpet and orange pews. And you know what? It was beautiful. Because it was the color of the day. That late 70s, that was it. If you had that today, you would look like late 70s, early 80s. We let, do we have recess lighting or chandeliers? Should we start at 10, 1030, or 11? What should we do? It's so easy to be divided if we're not careful. But if we keep the main, as, as the previous football, previous football coach at Buffalo Gap said, if you keep the main thing the main thing, then you forget about all of the stuff that's not the main thing. The main thing is the Lord. The main thing is staying in Him. The main thing is winning people to the Lord, seeing people get saved, seeing people's lives be changed by the power of His grace and His love. It's not about all of this stuff. It's about that. So in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, now there's going to be two names here. I would like to go around and get some of you all to say them. Because I had to look them up. And then I had to listen to them. And I still got it written down here in my notes so that I get them right. Because one of them doesn't look anything like it sounds. I implore you idea. Okay, some of you all say you odia. You idea. And I implore, synthetic, that's kind of what it looks like, but that's not it. It's Sutuke. Sutuke. We practiced last night as we were getting ready to go to bed. I said, "Hun, well, how do you say this word? And we looked it up. Sutuke. That's how we kind of went to sleep, almost saying that word. Sutuke. You own it. You ought to. And Sutuke, I implore you to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, what's he saying? Listen, don't be distracted. Don't be divided. I want you to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with commend also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So what is, what's happened here? These two ladies, Euodia and Suntuke, have had disagreements and they've, they've kind of split. He says, I want to, I said, I implore them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Don't get distracted by this stuff. Don't let there be a division. I don't want you to be divided. I implore that they be of the same mind. And I urge you also, true companions. They don't know who this true companion was. Some people say maybe it was Epaphroditus. They're not sure who it was. But help these women who labored with men. Help them. 
come together. And the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. What does he say? They're believers. Their names are in the book. But we can't be divided. We can't be separate. We've got to be of the same mind in the Lord. Going back to the example I said, maybe you like pews. Maybe you like chairs. Does it really matter? No, we've got to be of the same mind in the Lord. And as we are, we're brothers and sisters. We're brethren. We love one another. And those things don't divide us. They're just our preferences. Preferences don't divide us. We're united how? In the Lord. There was a song years ago, and, and my mother's mentioned, we need to go back and see that, sing that, that we're one in the blood. Because of the blood, we're together. Because of what Jesus has done, we're united. It's because of him. He said, I want you to be of the same mind in the Lord. Paul appeals for there to be unity in the church. And it's not just the pastor's problem. The whole church is part of keeping the unity. When fire pops up, what do we do? We put it out. Look what Proverbs 26, verse 20 says. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bear, strife ceases. Listen. We're part of keeping the unity. We're not divided if we keep the main thing, the main thing. And who is that? That's Jesus and what he's done and what he's doing in our life. And the fact that this is in our citizenship. We've got a place in heaven prepared for us. And one day he's coming back and we're going to be with him. Forget about this stuff. Forget about these things. Maybe we need, if, the, if the chairs are, and listen, I, I use the chairs and the pews as an example because that's never been a problem. You say, well, Pastor, who, who wanted pews? I can't believe that. No, that's never been a problem. I just use that as an example because that's it's, it's little things like that. The Bible tells us it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's those little things. See, it's that stuff that, that Satan wants to creep in and divide. Now, you can tell this that the division was serious because Paul calls them out by name. He doesn't just say, well, I know there's division, but become unified. He says, no. Euodia and Sutuke, they they've become separated. They need to get back together and have the same mind in the Lord. He called them out. How, many, how do you feel when you get called out? Anybody ever been called out in work or in some other situation? Paul Paul does it. You know what? It's now for all the world to see. For centuries down, he, it was a serious problem. Church, we need to be of the same mind in the Lord. If our purpose and our goal is to see people one to him and see to see his name exalted, we can't let any, anything divide us. We can't let fires come up. We can't throw wood on the fire. We've got to realize that we're one in him. It's all about him. Paul wanted unity, I believe, in three specific areas. First one, unity and salvation. As believers with our names written in the book of life, we're unified in heaven's perspective. See, if we get our minds off of earthly things and realize our citizenship is in heaven, these things aren't going to matter so much. We've got to be unified in our salvation. We've got to, be uni we've got to have unity in spirit. Paul wanted them to have the same mind. If we have the mind of Christ, we should be one as the Father in Christ and the Spirit are one. And then he wanted unity and service. Paul reminded the church that Euodia and Suntuke had been united in service. Yes, they had worked together. Staying focused and mission on mission and service will guard against division. See, when you're pulling together, you can't pull apart. We got to stay together. We got to work together. Why? Who's it about? Me or about him? Is it about you or about him? It's all about him. He said, we have the same mind in the Lord. It's all about him, about what he's doing and what he's working in us and how he's moving. And a third principle that Paul gives there, it says, don't be discouraged. Look at verse 4 in Philippians chapter 4. He says to do what? Rejoice in the Lord sometimes or occasionally, right? Oh, hold on. Let's stop there for a second. How many do that? Now, I want I said, that's. If we're honest, how many rejoice in the Lord always? Now that rejoice, we think about joy. Have joy in the Lord 
always. And then he says what? Go on to verse 4. And again, I say what? So I said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, if he's repeating it, what's that tell us he's doing? He's emphasizing it. You need to rejoice. You need to have joy. Listen, you're going to go through stuff. Life's going to get hard. Life's going to have its discouragements. Life's going to have days that you're just down. Some of you right now, you're upset because it's going to get colder, and you're going to get you're going to have to go out when it's you're getting it's dark at five now, five thirty. You don't like that. You don't like it getting colder. You have to put a coat on. You don't want to wear a coat. You're just upset. You want the sun. You want the sand. You want the breeze. You want all of it. Listen, it's getting colder. Some of you right now are discouraged about that. And what is Paul saying? Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Have joy. No matter what's going on around you. No matter what is happening. Find your joy in who? The Lord. If you're finding your joy in your spouse, they're going to let you down. If you're finding your joy in your children, they're going to let you down. If you're finding your joy in your parents, kids, they're going to let you down. If you're finding your joy in your friends, they're going to let you down. He says, rejoice in who? The Lord. He's telling us to have the same mind in who? The Lord. What do we have our unity in? The Lord. It's all about Christ. It's not about us. I don't find joy in myself. I'm getting ready tomorrow to have about 21 basketball players who are not going to have any joy in me either. Because we got a week and a half to get them in shape before the first scrimmage. And one was back there not smiling at me right now about that. <laughs> but rejoice in the Lord. It's all about Him. See, over time, distractions and divisions can wear us down. Paul didn't want discouragement to overtake the Philippians. He wanted them to experience joy, not just happiness. It's not based upon our happiness. There's days I'm not real happy. But it doesn't mean I don't have joy in who? The Lord. There's going to be days you just don't feel like it. You just ain't feeling it. It's okay. You find your joy in the Lord. It's all about him. See, in, this, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, it said this. For me to die, to live is who? Christ. And to die is gain. For me to live, it's Christ. It's all about him. It's got to be about Jesus. It's got to be about what he's done. It's got to be about who he is. It's got to be about who you are in him. The world's going to tell you lots of different things about yourself. You got to understand who you are in Christ, and when you do, it changes your life. It changes your perspective, and you can find joy. Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say, rejoice. So don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Your joy is in the Lord. That overcomes discouragement. That overcomes that lack of happiness sometimes you have in your life. That joy in the Lord. We need to learn to choose joy in Him. Life is challenging and difficult, but nothing temporal can change the eternal for us. See, nothing that happens in this world changes your citizenship and the fact that He's going to change your lowly body and you're going to go be with Him. As I said before, it doesn't matter who's president, it's not going to affect the Lord. He didn't get up and, oh, did you see that? They had an election. What are we going to do? It didn't surprise him. He didn't, oh, what's going to be, what's going to happen to the economy now? Oh, what's it? no. It's all about him. And we rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. And then it goes into verse 5 where he tells us, don't be defensive. Uh-oh. See, don't Paul kind of weird. Don't be divided and don't be discouraged. And I said, don't be divided. Look at verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at 
hand. Now that word there for gentleness means to be reasonable. Anybody ever met somebody that's unreasonable? You have. Some of you don't want to shake your hand. Some of you, I see some people touching others. I'm not sure if that's for that or what. I'm not sure. But you know what? Sometimes we can be unreasonable. Anybody here ever been unreasonable? And you look back and say, wow, I didn't need to be unreasonable. You probably didn't think about being unreasonable. I shouldn't have been a jerk. Something like that. But he says, don't let your gentleness be, un be known to all men. Paul wanted them to not be extreme, obsessive, inflexible, or unreasonable. He's not talking about compromising on doctrinal essentials, but about being accommodating when dealing with others in the body. Just like he said about Yodia and Zutuke, how that they could they had a disagreement. He wants us to understand if we're rejoicing in him and it's about him and we don't have to be discouraged about all of this stuff, the things that divide us, if they're not scriptural, it shouldn't be we shouldn't get defensive about it. What they call those? Those are just preferences. They're not issues that divide us. Why? Because it's about the Lord. It's about Him. It's about seeing people's lives be changed because of the power of Jesus Christ and the gospel. But we get defensive about things. I'll go back to it. We gotta have pews. That's how we always had church. But we gotta have chairs. We gotta be able to move them. I can stretch out my legs more. Pews are just so inflexible. We can't be unreasonable. He says, let your gentleness, gentleness be known to who? Just those in the church? To all. Sometimes we can be very unreasonable. In the church, we can be like, oh, yes, whatever. Then we get outside the church and it's like, uh-oh. -uh. He says, let your gentleness be known to who? Just church people? Just the brethren, just your family, to all men. Doesn't mean we're compromising on the things of God, but it means that we're reasonable in our relationships. Why? Because as we're reasonable and our gentleness is known, I believe doors will open up and we can share the good news of Jesus. But if you're unreasonable, nobody wants to be around you. If you're difficult, nobody wants to be in your area. They don't want to be around you. They got too many things going on in their life to be around difficult people. He says, don't be unreasonable. Let your gentleness, gentleness be known. Paul is saying here, don't be defensive when it comes to your brothers and sisters. Don't always be looking for an argument. Ever, ever met somebody who's argumentative by nature? They just like to argue. And they're happiest when they argue. Have you ever seen couples that seem happiest when they argue? <laughs> It just seems like they, it just drives their like, oh, we, we love each other. And then they just argue all the time. He says, don't be argumentative. Don't be like that. Let your gentleness be known. And he said, gives the reason. That's what, he gives the reason right there. The Lord is at hand. Now, Paul always goes back to the same mind in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is at hand. It's all about Christ. It's all about our Savior. It's all about what he's done. It's all about who he is. And as, we, as our mind is focused and the Lord is at hand, I believe our divisions have to go. I believe our unreasonableness has to go. I believe our, our defensiveness has to go. Why? Because the Lord, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you even to the end. He says he's there. He says he never changes. If he said he'd be there, he's going to be there. The Lord is at hand wherever you're at. Or wherever you are doing, whatever you are doing, remember the Lord is at hand. I think we forget that. I think we say, well, nobody saw that, or the preacher didn't see that. My neighbor didn't really see that. My, my, nobody, my, my, my church family didn't see that, so if I'm unreasonable, they don't know. And what he's saying is, the Lord is at hand. And I believe it also says this, he's coming soon. I believe his coming is at hand. He's at hand. His presence is at hand. His help is at hand. His strength is at hand. His joy is at hand. We need to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. The Lord is at hand. No matter what you're facing, you are not alone. You can keep pressing forward. You can reach 
Keep reaching for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Don't be defeated. Don't be divisive. Don't be discouraged. And don't be defensive. Why? The Lord is at hand. He's with you. You're going to get through. You're going to make it because of the Lord. And you're trusting Him. Letting Him be your help. You don't have to get down. To fight back. To stand fast. Stand fast. Why, why can you stand? You know you've got victory. And it's not about you. It's not about what you can do. I think sometimes we, we there's been lots of songs that, that had, um, talk about us going after. There's one that said, I went to the enemy's camp. And I took back what he stole from me. It used to be a big song. The enemy's got nothing for us to get. We've got everything we need in Christ. And what did he say? I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. And if we're, if we're in him, he's our healing. He's our blessing. He's our strength. He's our hope. He's our everything. But he's at hand. You're going to make it. We're going to make it together. We need each other. I think it's one thing we can get out of this. We need each other. You can't do this alone. And I want to encourage you, don't try to do this alone. That's why we get together, so we're not doing it alone. That's why we have dinner, so we get together. You know what? Some of you don't know each other very well. So I gave you a little paper and said, I want you to write down five things you know about that person. And I didn't point anybody out, that's why I pointed up here. Some of you couldn't put down but one. I think I know their name. And that's okay. We're still family. We still work together. We still love one another. We're still part of the beloved. Why? It's about the Lord. The Lord is at hand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessings and your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that you are at hand, that you are so near. And that, Lord, because you're near, Lord, we can have joy. We can rejoice. Lord, no matter what happens in life, no matter the ups and downs, the discouragements, Lord, the, the, the times of, of, of great um, rejoicing. Lord, does it matter about those? We still find joy because we are in you. You're our help. You're our everything. So, Lord, we just honor you today. We exalt that name of Jesus. We exalt the Lord. And we just thank you that you are at hand that you are near, and that you are ever present. Church, right now, with your heads bowed, I know that some of you are going through times of discouragement. Maybe you're going through some things that would make you defensive, maybe make you unreasonable. Maybe you have some struggle. Right now, I want to give you just a moment to just talk to the Lord in your own way, right there where you're at. As Holy Spirit speaks to you, you talk to the Lord. Give it to Him and trust His working in you. Father, we thank you that you are working in every heart. We believe, Holy Spirit, that you are working in lives today. And church, if you're here today and Holy Spirit is speaking to you and, and drawing you to a relationship with Christ, I want to pray a simple prayer that comes from Scripture. And if you pray and believe it, it says you shall be saved. And then he'll start a work in your life of turning things around and turning you from things into him. But it start, starts with simple belief and faith in Christ. So if you if you if Holy Spirit is drawing you and you need to and you want to pray, 
I want you to pray this prayer with me, and I want you to believe it as you pray it. I'm going to ask those that are here that you've prayed this in the past, you would pray it again with those that maybe prayed it for the first time. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead. And based on that confession, I am saved. Thank you for changing my life and changing my eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand right now with us? We'll go back and sing the verse and the chorus.